Hello. Yeah, hi. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. Good. A little soft. Okay. So it's listening in. So welcome to the meeting. Um, we had not have a meeting last week. Uh, there was a holiday in the U.S. and Canada, so we had, uh, and I think uh, Dick and um, Susan are still out. So why don't we uh, get started? Uh, my knock, you have uh, been busy with your GSOC work. Yeah. So why don't you, uh, do you have an update to present? Of course. Okay. Uh, I'll just go ahead and share my screen. All right, go ahead. And I'll be presenting the updates for week four and week five because we didn't have meeting last week. Okay. So yeah. Might be good. a bit long. So. Oh, that's okay. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. So I quickly give you a recap of what happened in week four, which was last week. So, which was the week actually that we missed out so yeah. week four like in that week I, I basically worked on preparing a rough training pipeline for the C. elegans nucleus segmentation model so the data set it sort of has it has the features and the labels of course and like as you can see to the left we have the we have the input images and, and to the right we have these the segmentation maps so my goal was to train a neural network which should be able to map the input images to the segmentation maps. So I, I basically uh, first I tried to define a very rough uh, a, a very rough pipeline to see if the if the approach is uh, viable or not. So I did that and I trained it for a couple of epochs, which is very low I know, but like at least I got a, a reasonably good score, which is a seventy nine percent intersection over union score of the segmentation maps. And these are the validation dice loss that I got and the learning dates, of course, they remain the same because the number of epochs were very small. And only after a couple of epochs, the model was actually performing, like, I mean, it's not bad. It was, it was sort of okay, as you can see here, like, uh, even if the input image contains a lot of noise, then the model is able to predict what was going on in the data. And that was actually for week four. And now I move. I'll go at week five. So in week four, I had prepared the rough training pipeline just to see if the if the approach works because there was literally no code available. Like there were, I really could not find any code or any uh, pre-trained models for this online. So it was absolutely from scratch. So in week five, which was last week, I I basically had to refactor the training loop that I had made in week four, uh, like to to enable faster prototyping and experimentation because like. Like everything was in one place, and like that actually enabled me to run a faster experimentation with the learning rates and all that stuff. And and uh, later it also enabled me to integrate Optima into the training pipeline, which was good. So the next step was uh, to find out the training hyperparameters for which I used this library, which I actually always use. So that library Optima. Like it, it actually does the hard work for you. Like if you can actually uh, define a range of the learning rates or the batch sizes that you want, and what the library will essentially do is that it will sample out from these from these uh, ranges, and then it will do training on the data that you that you give it. And I actually ran two hundred trials of Optima, each of which had like. The model was trained on the 10% of fraction of the available training data for three epochs. So each trial of the 200 trials, the model was trained on on a 10% fraction of the available data, and it was trained for three epochs. So it was actually trained for 600 epochs on just a, a very small fraction of the data. But like uh, like uh, Optima actually did the hard work for me, and it actually found out these two parameters, which it thought. Would, would work well for me out of the 200 pairs. These are these were the best results. And actually, like after each of the 200 trials, the 
the function it actually uh, returns the intersectional union code and this and this, and the best run that we got it actually had the best intersection over the union score so that's the reason I'm, i i would be using this so I actually use the exactly same parameters to train which actually works out of well and like i trained it for 15 pops which took about 3 hours which was long but it was actually worth it because the results were pretty good so these are the training hyper parameters as you can see like, it goes from like in the zero epoch the the intersection over union score is very low, it's around 6, 6 But it goes up, but it keeps going up further and further as I train. But I didn't go any further because, like, there is also, because there is always a risk of overfitting the model, and like, it's just not good practice to go over such large numbers. Anyways, so these are the results that I got. Uh, okay, so the so the image to the left, it basically showcases. It basically shows 3D data in form of 2D slices because the model that I have trained it can actually run predictions only on 2D slices. So, out of the 3D, like in the 3D data, it is it is essentially 2D slices, right? So, the model can run predictions on those 2D slices and it actually uh, yielded these uh, results, which are which are pretty good. And then coming to the static examples, so it's actually hard to see if the model is actually performing well or not because everything is moving here so coming to the same examples these are the uh, these are the original masks this column the middle column and the column to the right this represents the the predictions of the model i'll go ahead and zoom into the image okay, okay. so to the left as we can see like the, the amount of noise is actually pretty high but still the model is able to map the segmentation like the segmentation maps properly like as you can see even the smaller details like if we notice out here here we have two nuclei and the same goes here like it's sort of in an intermediate stage they are not exactly two different uh, separate entities but they're overlapping sort of and the model also like it basically also was able to map it so which is of course which is a good thing so these are the so these are the important samples and all of this work is actually available in GitHub and pushed it to the GSOC 21 repo. So if, so if someone is interested, they, then it's in the cell nuclear segmentation, uh, it's in the cell nuclear segmentation folder and this is the notebook that I had used and, the, and this GIF that you see here, this actually contains data from one single time point but and it's actually made using code from this notebook itself, this code. So if someone is interested, they can just go ahead and check it out. So I'll drop a link to the GitHub in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> so this was the pull request you issued, uh, it was a couple days ago. Yeah, I actually issued a pull request for the, for the training notebook, yeah. Okay, yeah, good. So that, that looks good. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the, I like this image here that you just showed. Um, yeah. Uh, which one is that? Uh, is this one? Yeah, this one here. So you have the input image where you have your two nuclei that are sort of next to one another, and you're able to preserve that with the mask to some extent, and then make the prediction. Yeah. No, this segmentation mask. This is actually the original data that we have. Oh, okay. So this and is a... This is actually, like, yeah, yeah. This is actually the target data that we have. The model tries to emulate these after training. Okay. But these are the results that we got, which are actually pretty close to what we had in the training data. All right. And then, but the prediction is it does preserve this. This uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. This and, small detail. Yeah, and it's actually improved by input images because you can see that it's a little bit more separated. So if I see yeah. something like this, it looks like it's going to be two cells. I can easily kind of detect that, or at least, yes, uh, yes. yeah. That's Plus, actually, the model is also able to map out the like the, the cells that are not uh, perceptible to the humans, the nuclei that are not very, very visible to humans. Like, as you can see here, like, there's hardly anything visible in these two parts of the image. 
but the original mask actually contains this and the, and the model was also able to predict that that there is something in, the, in this in this place so that's something and yeah that's x yeah even the imperceptible stuff is also being predicted and it's actually being done correctly so okay and then you but have yeah, this there's always room for improvement so maybe i'll yeah. improve on this too yeah, so. we'll go back up to your graphs uh, a little bit. Yeah. yeah, this one. So the IOU score is intersection over union. So yes. that means uh, that you're looking at, like, there's an intersection between the two, like the prediction and the and the in the mask. Yes. And then that's versus yes, like yes, the yes. empty set, which would be the union where there's no overlap at all. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the idea is that the more they overlap, the better it is, better the score. Actually, that's the true idea. In, in like, if the if the data that we get, if the segmentation match that the provided data set has, if the data is perfect, then we should actually shoot for an IOU score of hundred. Okay. Yeah. Which is which should be one in this case. But the data that we have, yeah, the segmentation maps as you can. Okay, I just zoom into it again. The data that we have, as you can see, like there are a couple of stray noise points, and the borders of the cells, as you can see, they are not very. Uh, I think uh, it's not very clear from this image, but in general, what I've noticed is that, as you can see, in the the borders of these uh, nuclei, they are not exactly round, and they are not exactly rounded enough. There are some extra uh, points that are coming out. Some of the it's actually hard to explain. You can see this cell, this is spherical in the prediction. This is round in the prediction, but in the mask, it's actually not round. Yeah. So that is actually, uh, like, that's actually a drawback of the data that we have, because in general, the nuclei, they're actually round. That's what I know. So I guess this is the drawback of the data. And in this case, this is actually not what we want in the final predictions. But the model, it's not actually giving this these uh, unnecessary curves around the edges, which is actually good news. So in this case, it's actually not a very good idea to shoot for an intersections intersection over union score of 100 or 1. So I actually stopped training early just to make sure that these uh, excess curves in the in the nuclei are not mapped and are not and the model actually does not learn how to map these two because they are not really important. Yeah, you don't want to have overfitting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, that's very good. I think that's a nice, um, you know, you're doing a very good job of applying the methods to the problem, to the data set. And this is a challenging data set. And, uh, you know, you're. I think you're learning a lot about those challenges and drawbacks oh, and making course, the trade offs. Yeah. 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 I Actually, I try to find like if if there are some existing code available, there are some existing uh, like some starter code available online to get started out. But I just couldn't find anything for this because like in general for the competitions, people usually keep it. They usually keep everything to themselves. They don't open source anything. So like, it was sort of difficult, but it's kind of done now. It's good news. So I could figure it out, and I learned a lot actually. That's good. That's good, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, just making some notes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So, um, what's your step for next this coming week? What do you plan to do? Uh, okay. In the upcoming week, I actually plan to build uh, the GUI for this for the simple online demo that I was planning for this tech. It will be similar to the cell cell membrane segmentation model, the online demo that we have for that. So I plan to have a drag and drop interface for this. The user will be able to drag and drop a PNG or a, or a JPEG file, and then they will be able to get the output to the right. But what I've realized is that like like at, like after I downloaded the data, the data was actually in format of TIFF files. So in the future, maybe uh, in the in the in the online demo itself, I'll have an option to input TIFF files directly. And then you get the output in format of the TIFF files only. So I guess that would be more useful for the scientists because the 
like the source of data that I like the data after it was sourced, it was actually in format of TIFF. So I guess that's the format they generally use to, to deal with this sort of data. Yeah. So I'll be doing that. Okay. Because it's it's actually not easy to convert a TIFF file to a PNG or a JPEG file. At least for a scientist or someone who is not into uh, computer science in general. So that would be a convenience, I guess. Y yeah, it would. Um, yeah, image conversion is a bit tricky. If you're doing it online, you know, you'd have to go back and, and pull it into some image manipulation program and then make like a batch and conversion, yes, which yes. is, yeah, it's... <laughs> yeah. yeah, so in general, the, some, some online conversion tools are available, but they generally compress the data. Right. In general, like some, some important features could be lost out in the compression. So that's also something you should keep in mind. And then uh, like, after that, what I want to do next week is I want to add this into the existing devolver library. I would add this separate model into the existing library. And then I'll, I'll swap out the devolver and cell membrane segmentation for the new upgraded one. It, it really wouldn't take much time to do this one, but I'll, I'll do it in this in this week itself. So yeah, these are the three things I have planned for upcoming week. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the update. Okay, um, so that's great. And um, if you're watching on YouTube and you want to know more, go to the uh, GitHub repository. My knock is pushing this to um, the DivaWorm uh, repo the DivaWorm directory uh, or the DivaWorm repository in the GSOC 2021 uh, uh, directory. So it'll be in that place. Uh, if you want to take a look, um, and then he's going to put this, uh, push this to uh, Devo Learn soon, so we'll have that incorporated. And then I don't know, uh, we might release another version, maybe either in the midpoint of GSOC or at the end of GSOC. I'm not sure yet, but I think that's good. Now, uh, I'm, I think the first evaluations are coming up this week. So I'm going to be making a, yes, yeah. So you don't have anything to worry about. I'll just fill it out, and then you'll have a opportunity to comment on it, okay. or you have to make comments, I think, too. But that they'll send you emails on that. So that'll be, but that has to be done by a certain deadline. So just make sure that you watch out for those emails. Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Uh, now I'm going to get into uh, some other things that we're going to switch gears and I want to go over the submissions. I don't think there's anything uh, pressing in the submissions, but I did want to go over this for people on YouTube who are watching. So this is our submission document and it's been a little inactive lately. We haven't had a lot of stuff coming up. We've submitted a lot of things, a lot of things have been presented. All of the uh, NetSci, all the network stuff has been presented. This uh, growth form and theory of deep learning, which was actually submitted under a different title, to NetNeuro that was put up on Twitter, advertised on Twitter, and uh, last, last week. And then I actually made a 10 minute video of this uh, kind of going over the poster for the attendees. So that that um, YouTube video is on our YouTube channel for um, this poster. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll see that 10 minute video and you can go through the poster and it's just a quick tour. And so that was that was from NetNeuro. The TopoNuts uh, workshop was also very good. Uh, they were very excited about the work. So this is the Euler Cycles for Life. and. Um, they were very excited about that work, and I think the next steps on that actually are to think about the input data for other types of organisms, or you know maybe uh, having you know maybe next year's GSOC project might one of them might be to have uh, to have input data and then have an interface where you can actually do this type of analysis on it. So um, there's you know there's a lot of potential for this, I think. And this again was like drawing a skeleton around the 
you know, a cell, or, a single cell, or a, a small multicellular colony, and then defining a network in terms of the edges instead of the nodes. So you have these boxes in a, in a you know, in a, some sort of a geometric array, and then you calculate the Euler completeness of that network, and then you determine its what we I guess call developmental state, whether there's this sort of overlap or whether there's this modularity or whether there, it's a complete circuit. So uh, there, I think there's a lot of potential to you know, test different types of input organisms. I know we have the Bacillaria. I don't know if that would be a good choice, but there are other uh, diatoms that, where we can get microscopy data for that. And then uh, we, also met, we also talked about potential sort of like, um, uh, sort of like, you know, computational models of the genetics and things like that. So, you know, we talked about binary networks, we talked about uh, um, uh, genetic regulatory networks, and, and those are uh, binary type models that allow you to express genes at certain points in time. So those can be incorporated as well. Um, the, the abstract is up on the fixture uh, where the slides are, but um, that, but that, you know, that's going to be sort of there's future work to do there. So that's that's that, and then uh, the main talk, uh, the embryo networks plus connectomes talk, which isn't the actual title, but I think we talked about that last time, and that went well too. Uh, that video is up on YouTube, and again, there's more work to do there. I think in terms of like. Under, like giving a more formal network structure. So the idea of this uh, talk was to say that there's this, uh, you know, there are a bunch of uh, developmental cells, as you see from our embryos, and those cells differentiate. And as they differentiate, they start to form two different types of networks. They form sort of an embryo network, which is an association of embryo cells or developmental cells, and then the uh, neuronal cells that start to differentiate and then you have those two networks that interact and then you have other things like the germline and you have other types of tissues that start to differentiate and form and so those form other networks as well and the idea was that there's this process of uh, you know uh, divergent integration so those cells diverge in terms of their fate but those networks are still integrated at some level and so they're diverging but there's maintaining some level of integration, um, but not as much as they would if they were the same type of cell. So that needs to be, I think there's a paper there. So just spelling that out a little bit more deeply and then linking it to a formal um, uh, network model. And then I don't know what kind of data we can bring to bear. We have data for C. elegans, of course, but um, they have to like, play around with the data to get it to work uh, <laughs> for the analysis. So that's that's something we can do later. Um, this could just simply be like a theoretical paper where we create pseudo data, where we have like, you know, different cells and, you know, make up states and, and do different like theoretical tests, like look at a random network versus like a structured network. There's a lot that we can do with that. So, um, so we have the different, so we have these other things that we've been kind of these longer term submissions. We have the test of Williams symbiosis. We have the molecular level simulations for diatom. And we have the movement simulations for diatom, which are at, at the anatomical level. So those are two different things. We have the quantitative comparison of our key and shaped droplets, which could fit in, plug into this uh, Euler Cycles for Life project or a paper, um, it would certainly give us data to work with. Um, and then we have the, a couple things here, the Eye of Nature book, which is something that we talked about Steve McGrew and we talked about his book. And I actually, uh, Dick sent the book to us, uh, to me and to, I think to Thomas or Tom Portages. And I've been looking it over. It's a very interesting manuscript. It was never published, but it's something that it's, it's on, sort of like evolution and how to teach evolution properly. And so it's it's an interesting book. Maybe we can, you know, I, I don't know 
we're not a publishing house, but it's possible we could make this available as a sort of an ebook or something in his honor. So we'll, we'll look into that. Then there's the differentiation tree of the brain, which I didn't bring the slides today, but I have some interesting information about this um, and some advances. I, I mean, you know, I'll probably wait till Dick comes back from vacation to talk about that, but that's something else. And then the mathematics of Diva Worm, which is this, um, it, right now it's a poster and we're going to try to make it into something a little bit more formal, but it has all the main equations of Diva Worm. Uh, we didn't put any, we don't really have a lot in terms of like deep learning. We have a, a generic uh, neural network. But uh, did you have something to say about that, Minoc? Okay. Okay. Oh, it's like uh, Akshay's here. Hello, Akshay. Hello. Um, so that's, I mean, that's something we can work on here, mathematics, a diva worm. I'd like to pull that up in the near future. We've also been making some progress on this uh, Baccalaureate Non-Neuronal Cognition paper. And this is something that is, it's long suffering and I've gotten extension after extension on this. And I've, I've been really trying to work on it, but I'm kind of getting some head, uh, some steam on this, some headway made. So uh, we'll, in the next couple of weeks, I think we'll be in a position where we're going to review it in the meeting and uh, go over some of the points on it and try to flesh it out into something that's really, you know, looks like a book chapter instead of uh, a set of notes. So, you know, that is uh, something, of course, that we're drawing from. We wrote this digital bacillary paper two years ago now, where we had the, um, we did this, uh, it was actually Ojoal and Azmit Singh who did this work with, um, you know, they, they kind of took what was available in terms of microscopy data. They analyzed it using, uh, a deep learning model and then they were able to you know we were able to have like a digital data set and then now we're looking at sort of the behavior of, of diatoms and this doesn't have a lot of data behind it but we're going to try to do some mathematical modeling instead and and you know that's where this is going so we haven't really been able to hang the data on this yet but i hope that we can at least come up with something for uh for a mathematical modeling audience so, uh, and then the other thing I wanted to mention, one final thing is this poster that was presented at NetNeuro actually has a lot of connections to the uh, artificial neural network, biological neural network stuff that um, that we were we've been talking about in the meetings. Um, Krishna and I and, and Jesse wrote a paper on this, a preprint, and there's actually a talk in the NetNeuro session on artificial neural networks and biological neural networks. Um, Alexandro Goulos, uh, who's a European um, scientist, he's done a lot of stuff with primate uh, brain imaging, I think, and some other topics like developmental neural net, you know, developmental networks in brains. He actually has this uh, technique where he can take data from like a, I think he was showing examples of the primate brain where they were able to take brain networks from the primate brain and map them to artificial neural networks. So it's really exciting and I put some slides of it up in the Slack and I don't have the Slack open right now but um, if you go to the Slack and you go to the Diva Worm channel you'll see those slides so you'll see some slides posted not in the not too recent past and that that's what that refers to that talk. So there's a lot going on in that area. Um, and he's actually created a program where you can do this, where you can convert the data. And so, um, and then actually, in fact, I'm also mentoring for Neuromatch and a, a group of mine is doing something similar with uh, the visual system. They're trying to take the visual system, I think it's a human visual system from M fMRI data and map it to a deep learning model where the different layers represent different parts of the visual stream. 
So that's all very, you know, up and coming stuff. So there's a lot of room there to, to contribute. And I don't know exactly how we contribute to that. <laughs> uh, this paper was a struggle to try to find like our voice on that. So I, I think that like, though, we can have a longer discussion about that in the near future if people want to um, be involved in that. And that's definitely something that, you know, it's, it's thinking more, more deeply about deep learning networks. You know, we talk about the metrics and its performance, but and then we talk about this broad analogy to the brain, but like, you know, what is it about the networks in the brain that are similar? And there's just so much, so many people are kind of just kind of fumbling around trying to find those analogies. And there's a lot of interesting stuff there, but, but there's a, you know, there's a lot of room for people to do stuff there. So, um, so that's the submissions. Uh, now I want to talk about uh, Neuromatch. And like I said, Neuromatch started last week. Um, and I, I've advertised it in the group here. And we've talked about Neuromatch um, and how they're going to, they have this computational neuroscience course going on right now. And in August, they're going to have a deep learning course. And if, you, if you're not enrolled, and if you didn't have time to enroll or you didn't want to, um, they actually have the materials online. So they have the syllabus here at this address. So this is Neuromat GitHub Neuromatch Academy course content. And they have the course material. So you can do what they call the observer track, which is to uh, just you know do the notes and go through it on your own. And the benefit to that is it's not evaluated. You're not, because it's kind of a brain dump when you go through it in the course. You know, you're doing like six hours of work every day and it's like you're trying to figure out what's going on and, and you have to like kind of stay with the course material or else you get lost. And so last year was the first year that they did this and there were a lot of complaints about that sort of brain dump model. So after the course, people were doing what they call the slow pod. And if you want to know more about that, ask Jesse, who's in our group. Um, it's basically unpacking this and going through it more slowly. But you can do this at your own pace if you go through the uh, tutorials and projects and you have the schedule for the different weeks. So you could do this in order or you could do it in, not in order. And it would, you know, it's supposed, one thing's supposed to build on another, but you could do it, you know, whatever you find interesting. Say you know about model types, you know, but you really want to get into this modeling part here week two and three so you could just go to week two and three and do that and explore that so um they have a lot of stuff too not just deep learning but in the computational neuroscience course they have bayesian models they talk about hidden markov models they talk about control models reinforcement learning and then network causality all which are important in neuroscience and uh, but they're not related to deep learning necessarily now the deep learning, uh, well, we'll get into that in a minute. So they just kind of give you some materials here. They talk about, you know, the things that you're doing. And this is all shared under a Creative Commons license. So this is all free to interact with and use. Um, now, if you go to the deep learning course content, which is a little bit different, this is, this is the first year they're doing the deep learning course. And I think, um, Krishna is going to be a TA for this, so congratulations, Krishna. Um, and this is, again, um, this is going to be, they don't really have the course materials worked out for this yet, but basically they're going to do, uh, they're going to get really deep into deep learning. They're going to do multi-layer perceptrons, optimization, regularization. So they're going to start with kind of the basics, uh, linear models, um, and then doing work with, a few, with fewer, more work with fewer parameters. So they're gonna show you how to use like convnets and RNNs and attention and transformers, generative models. And this is of course, according to deep learning. So, you know, generative models, there are a lot of different types of generative models, but they're gonna focus on a couple here that are GANs and VAEs. So uh, variational autoencoders and generative adversarial networks. So these are all like really, you know, uh, this kind of demystifies a lot of the the model zoo that you have in deep learning and in um, machine learning. 
and then advanced methods. So they actually do get into reinforcement learning, unsupervised and self-supervised learning, uh, reinforcement learning for games. Uh, and they're, they, you know, they have some big names here coordinating this. So they have uh, Tim Lillicrap and Blake Richards and Jane Wong and um, Joshua Vogelstein. So these are people who have done a lot of work on different things in the field. So this is a very good, uh, you know, if you're interested in following along with this, um, you know, the, the notes will be available. So I wanted to make that, uh, I wanted to highlight that as it's going along. And I have two groups of mentoring for the computational neuroscience uh, course. And they're doing, one One is doing the uh, ANN, BNN comparison, and another one is doing a um, neuroimaging project. So this is this is all something we can follow up on. Um, definitely it's good to, if you want to brush up on some of these topics, it's a good place to go. Uh, so let me give you a quick update on DevoLearn. There's not much going on, but like as uh, as Minox said, he was going to update, he's going to do a DevoLearn update soon, maybe in the next couple weeks and do a push to the repository. And so you know, we'll have, uh, I don't know if we'll do a new version release on this, but we can, you know, we don't really have a versioning scheme. So if it's something that we can um, see, uh, I just wanted to see where we are. We have 14 contributors right now. We haven't had any uh, pull requests issued since the GSOC application period, which is fine. It's just, you know, that's our sort of our rush time for people issuing pull requests. Um, and so, yeah, we're sort of at our, I can't remember what version we're at right now, uh, 0. What is it? Oh, 0.3.0. So more to come on that. Um, so I was going to do an update on the task board. Maybe I'll just kind of, we'll just look at it and take it in. Um, we have a lot of things that are sort of in progress. I encourage people to look through this board and if you find something you like, um, why don't we, you know, follow up on it. I think there are a couple things here that are um, done, but that's okay. Um, yeah, so there are some things outstanding like getting data from certain people and recruiting people to work in, as contributors and this, uh, oh, this Euler Paths for Life paper. So there are, there are things that need to be updated. Presentation that's done. Um, I might, next week I might present on the um, stuff that was done at Networks 2021, but I'm not quite sure. I didn't have time this week to do it. But, um, and then we have a bunch of action items here. So if you're interested in like following up on some of this, if you want to contribute, uh, let me know. If you have things to add, let me know. We can put them in the, in the to-do and we can move them around the board. So let's see. We have some things in the chat. Let me come back to this. Okay, so um, I now shared his... Uh, I think this was his pull request that it was merged. Um, this is the, okay. Uh, Akshay says, sorry, hello, sorry I joined late, had some summer school procedures, no problem. Um, Akshay asked, uh, my knock, how's your GSOC project going? He said, going good so far. The NeuroMatch Academy course seems interesting. Yeah. And then that's uh, this week's blog post from my knock, GSOC progress, this is week five. So if you're following along, and week four is also on that blog, it's just a different link, week four instead of week five. So if the blog post is usually just a recap of what he presents here. So, um, so yeah, I put, I put a link to it in the Slack as well in one of the channels, so definitely check that out. Uh, did my knock or actually have any questions before I move on? Any comments? Uh, yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I actually wanted to work on the ANN BNN uh, paper. I guess it's a paper, right? If I'm not wrong. 
Yeah, we we have a preprint on it, but it's you know we're gonna do another version of it. Um, I can loop you is into it, this. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there something I can do like? Um... Well, I mean, I guess what I could do is I could send you some of the materials that we have now, and then you could give okay. some feedback on that. Um, so we have a preprint and we have a poster, and I'll send you those links after the meeting. Um, and then you yeah, can yeah. maybe give some feedback on what, what you think might improve it or, you know, what direction we might go. And uh, it might, you know, yeah, it sure. might, yeah. yeah sure. so it might fit into the paper. It might be some new thing that we do, but um, we're going to keep driving it forward. <laughs> yeah, 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 I got it, yeah. Uh, like, uh, well, what about Susan? Is she coming anytime soon, like, to meet you? I think she's Is still she on, on vacation. I mean, yeah, so oh. she'll be coming, I think, next week. Okay, okay, okay. Because, like, I thought of doing something else, like, till uh, I wait for the astronaut uh, data set, so. Yeah, I don't know where she is on that. I think she was busy with uh, her exams and her yeah, graduate yeah, program. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, Brad, you, you can send me the links, like, on Slack. Uh, yeah. I would, I would go through that. Yeah, I will. All right. And then, um, yeah. Anything else, my knock? Like, okay, so you are talking about the Devolan release that we could have. Yeah. So I was actually talking to Mayuk about this, and he said me that uh, by the end of the GSOC this year, we surely be having another new version of uh, Devolan, which would be the upgraded version. So that's the new release is actually coming. It it's, it's actually not very far. We could have two releases, but I think having a, a, a one single release that could, uh, which would have all the upgrades, would be better, I guess. So, yeah, that's it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I mean, you know, it's like uh, we don't really have a versioning scheme, but it, it should be something that's consistent. Like you know, if we just have like a little bit of an upgrade, it's not that desirable to have it in in place before we have the whole uh, you know till it all it's all sort of integrated yes yeah so yeah we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out and so um, yeah but but everyone be on the lookout I mean the end of GSOC is coming up sooner than we think so but we'll, we'll have that out yeah um, and then I yeah I don't know what we'll do in terms of promoting the new version. I think it's definitely worth like kind of you know I've been doing these presentations to different groups on Diva Learn, and I don't know how many people are really getting interested. Uh, I, I presented at INCF, so I don't know who saw it, but we have materials, and I'll do maybe another uh, short update presentation, maybe put it on YouTube, or we can do some other promotion of it um so you know just keep, i guess you just have to keep getting out there and updating it and people will start to use it but it's uh it's yeah, yeah. so okay that's good now let me go i'm gonna do papers um and i have some things papers and then maybe some other things in the folder as well so let's see so we have uh let's see so I have this, I remember visit a question that I think Dick brought up several weeks ago, maybe several months ago now. We talk about environment a lot in the group, especially with respect to development. And he had a question that was basic, very basic. He said, what is it? What is its relevance and how do you define it? So this is environment. When people use the word environment. They typically mean like the world outside of like say the biological unit. So like the world outside the embryo or the world outside the egg or the world outside the organism. But what it, you know, that's still not really enough to really understand what it is. That could be anything. And, and the effects are very hard to, to parse out. If it's just like me walking down the street, you know, if it's a sunny day or if it's raining, there are different, all sorts of different inputs depending on where I am in the world and, and whatever. So, you know, that's, that's how it's it's very vague in that sense, but there are actually two things we came up with after that question, and uh, I think this is mainly my response. But I think we talked about it a little bit offline. 
The first is that environment is permissive. And that that means is that it allows for things to happen where it enables things to happen. And so uh, general information such as changes, like if it's really hot out versus not really hot out, or stresses, which is this heat, but it's you know at a very high level of tolerance for the organism, or intensities, uh, like such as you know, like really strong light or really high temperatures. Those are all kind of interrelated, are transduced into the biological system. So, for example, if you take like a, a Drosophila egg or a Drosophila, set of Drosophila eggs and you raise them at a high temperature, you can get them to mutate in different ways. And it doesn't mutate the genome, it mutates the phenotype. Um, there's this thing called a reaction norm that happens in some organisms that uh, actually changes the, the way the phenotype is expressed. But it's in general, environment is permissive. It allows for that change. Another example is like um, neuroplasticity. So in, you know, in uh, like a, a small mammal, maybe you have in in their when as they're being raised after they're born, uh, they have to interact with their environment to kind of get a sense of the world. And so they have these things called enriched versus impoverished environments. So the enriched environment would be where they have a cage where they have all sorts of toys. An impoverished environment would be where they don't have anything there. And so that actually has an effect on the, on the uh, brain phenotype. And so environment is permissive. But environment is also instructive. And that means that the environment will, tell, will give information to the biological system. So specific information, such as ratios, patterns, and codes, are all transduced into the biological system. So, you know, there, there are different patterns of like, you know, uh, if, if there's a period of starvation, for example, and there's no input of food or energy into the organism, that can inf affect the sort of the expression of the phenotype in development. For uh, moreover, you can have, um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, you can have some sort of information in the environment um, you know, like light source that can affect uh, how, say, the visual system develops. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But that, you know, those are all things that are sort of, and this is, again, at a very general level. So you want to get drilled down, you, you can use these sort of two points to kind of think about how your specific system develops and what kinds of information specifically is affecting in these ways. So that leads us to this paper here um, by Danny Nilsson and Jochen Smolka. And uh, they're biologists, and they're interested in this idea of quantifying biologically essential aspects of environmental light. So the environment for them, they're focusing in on just light. And they're asking the question, what are the essential biological aspects of this? And then how do we quantify this so we can measure it measure the differences in intensity or in amount and how does that affect the developmental process or I guess in this case just generally. So the abstract is quantifying and comparing light environments are crucial for interior lighting, architecture, and visual ergonomics. So these are things in the human world uh, but you can see how they, they're, they're also important in animal development and plant development and so on. Yet yeah, current methods only catch a small subset of the parameters that constitute a light environment and rarely account for the light that reaches the eye. Here we describe a new method, the Environmental Light Field Method, or ELF, which quantifies all essential features that characterize a light environment, including important aspects that have previously been overlooked. The ELF method uses a calibrated digital image sensor with wide angle optics to record the radiances that would reach the eyes of people in the environment. So here they're talking about radiances. And they're actually specifically focused on how we perceive light with our eyes. Now, this is interesting in development because although that could have a developmental relevance, um, you know, a lot of the things in development involve, you know, maybe exposure, like in plants, exposure to light, the angle of the light, uh, the radiance, the, the 
frequency of the light or the color, and then, you know, also heat energy. So there are a lot of things we can quantify, and it's maybe even broader in terms of development. Um, but, you know, in, in visual development, where, you know, when you're trying to figure out what to look at in development as a child or in, in your developmental period, this is also important in the development of eyes. So, um, so they use these tech, they use these me uh, measurement techniques to sort of get a sense of what the light is, and then what you know optimal light is, um, and then as a function of elevation angle, it quantifies the absolute photon absolute photon flux, its spectral composition in the red, green, blue resolution, as well as its variation or contrast span. So now they're breaking down light into these different aspects of its uh, spectral properties. And so now they're trying to make a statement. And people do this with plants, I think, as well. Or in, in some, well, they don't do it in, like, uh, exposure to, like, uh, light radiation or something like that. But, like, they'll do, I think they're, in, if, in fact, in um, photosynthesis, uh, the spectral composition is important for driving that process. But, you know, that's something that people measure um, but this is just a way to like, kind of think about how to quantify this. Together, these values provide a complete description of the factors that characterize a light environment. The ELF method this offers a powerful and convenient tool for the assessment and comparison of light environments. So you can compare light environments. We also present a graphic standard for easy comparison of light environments. Show that different natural and artificial environments have characteristic distributions of light. So this is... Uh, this is important for um, visual ecology, environmental psychology, lighting science. Um, that, that's sort of their intended audience. And then they kind of get into the mathematics. They actually look at um, the CIE pl uh, palette, which is what a lot of people use to look at color differences. So when you think of like how to define a color, it, like in a, in, a, in a computational image, uh, oftentimes we use RGB, but there's the CIE standard, which is like a color map, which breaks, it's like the, I think it's the subtractive aspect of color instead of the additive, but those sorts of things still have problems. Um, so another problem with current methods for measuring environmental light comes from a standardized spectral sensitivity on which units such as Lux and Candela are based. In lighting, the spectral sensitivity is generally taken as representing human vision, although it is in fact only the spectral sensitivity of the retinal channel for achromatic contrast measured in the retinal center. It ignores the blue cones in the retinal channel for channels for color vision. Uh, for example, it only targets one of the several subsystems of human vision and severely underestimates the spectral width of human vision. So these photometric units also correctly assume that eyes measure the energy content of light, whereas all biological photoreceptors measure photon flux. So this is not an insignificant problem because over the complete visible spectrum, and again, this is just in the eye or in the human eye, because in, 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 um, in uh, some eyes, like in, in uh, amphibians, they have different types of UV cones and things like that. Um, photon energy differs by 75 percent so there's this they're they're kind of making the point that like the methods that we have now are really uh you know not up to the task of what we want to do to characterize environment so there are a lot of things here that they kind of go through they go through their own approach to this and then this is the single scene and this is how they've kind of uh show this visual space or this this light space um, they're doing these, uh, they're doing these extractions and they're building images out of them. So they're quantifying, quantifying environmental light with the environmental light field method. So they're acquiring data with a, a camera. They're using a fisheye lens. They're using the mounted bubble to standardize the images. And then they're generating these images that are these sort of environmental light field images of, of the space. Brad, one thing. Uh, can uh, Susan use the fisheye lens for the, the axolotl embryo also? Like, it would make my task easier as well. Oh, 
Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe I'll ask. You mean just in general, like on the different uh, images that she's acquiring? Yep. 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 Yeah. I, I, well, I can ask her. We can we can bring that up. Because I think she's just experimenting with the way it's set up. And I think the cameras that she has are just basically have the the straightaway. I mean, you could put, I guess you could put a bubble filter on it. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we'll see. Yeah. yeah, I'll ask. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that does, cur that does provide curvature to the image in some ways. So there's that aspect of it. Um, yeah, so then this is the... So they kind of go over their method here. They show some results. And then that's their argument for the paper is that this is how you can quantify the visual world or the light world in, in this way. So this is an interesting paper. I, I wouldn't have thought to approach it this way, but uh, it's definitely one. So, you know, maybe in the future we'll find more papers like this, um, thinking about other aspects of the environment that we can quantify and it's really good to go through that like critical view of it. Um, another thing that we have here is this paper on, uh, this is a new paper. I put it in the, if you go to the Slack and you go to the new papers tab, or the, I think I think it's new papers or uh, current papers or something like that. There's a channel where we fo uh, feature papers. I put this paper in, this is towards a living soft micro robot through optogenetic locomotion control of C. elegans. So it's like this is by a Chinese group, and they're doing this uh, work with. Uh, uh, they're trying to build, I guess, a, a microbot based on C. elegans mo motion. So the abstract reads: Learning from the locomotion of natural organisms is one of the most effective strategies for designing microbots. And these are small micro robots that, uh, you know, move, they want to use biological mechanisms to move them because those are well established at that scale. However, the development of bio inspired micro robots is still challenging because of technical bottlenecks, such as design and seamless integration of the actuation mechanisms and the energy source. So they have to, you know, put a battery in it, they have to make the actu actuation work at that scale. It's very hard to get those things well designed, you know, design them pretty well and get them optimized. So they want to directly harness the activation energy and intelligence of living tissues. Uh, here we propose an approach to engineering the genetic and nervous system of a nematode, C. elegans, and creating an untethered, highly controllable living soft micro robot called RoboWorm. So uh, the Open Worm Foundation has a robots group. Uh, they haven't done this, they haven't taken this approach, but they basically are taking the approach of building a large worm, figuring out like from a neural circuit perspective, what the movement is supposed to look like and then mapping that to the robot movement. And then eventually shrinking that down to whatever size you want. But they're not taking this approach, which is a bit different. So a living worm is engineered through optogenetic and biochemical methods to shut down the signal transmissions between its neuronal and muscular systems, while its muscle cells, cells still remain optically excitable. So they're using these optogenetic, uh, they're basically um, trying to shut down certain parts of like the neural circuit, the connection between the neural circuit and the muscles, and then they're trying to measure this and then transfer, transfer that information into the, into the robot. Through dynamic modeling and experimental verification of the worm crawling, we found that the phase difference between the worm body curvature and the muscular activation pattern generates the thrust force for crawling locomotion. By reproducing the phase difference by optogenetic excitation of the worm body muscles. So optogenetic excitation is where they take light of a certain frequency and they stimulate the tissue or they stimulate the neurons depending on how they use it. Sometimes they use optogenetics in the brain. And there's a, uh, they, they, ins they inject a protein. It's a light sensitive protein. And they put it into the tissue that they want to measure from, or the neurons. And then they use this optogenetic beam that is at a certain frequency that stimulates this protein. So the idea is that you can, you have this sort of, this uh, sensor in the cells, it's a protein. And then you have this effector, which is the, uh, the light source. 
and the light source will then activate the muscle or activate the neurons at that frequency of stimulation. So you can actually turn on and off neurons or turn on and off muscle uh, in a very controlled way. And so, um, so they're, they're using optogenetic excitation. We emulated the major worm crawling behaviors in a controllable manner. Furthermore, with real-time visual feedback of the worm crawling, we realized close loop regulation in the movement direction and destination of single worms. This technology may facilitate uh, more information about the biophysics and neural basis of crawling locomotion and C. elegans. So they're, yeah, they're using this uh, optogenetics technique to sort of get at how the worm moves, decoupling the muscle from the, the neural circuit, and then kind of reverse engineering that and then be you know building this into the robot so it's it's a really interesting approach um let's see if they have any okay so this is this is how they deliver the optogenetic signal they'll use a like a light source in a microscope they'll kind of you know hit different parts of the tissue where they've injected the protein and then they'll stimulate those areas with that light uh frequency so you can see that there's, uh, they have their experimental setup, um, and then they show how it moves with the laser beam activation. And then they have this thrust force analysis, um, and then they're inducing movements, and then they're able to take that, uh, take that information and incorporate it into the design of this robot. It's a really interesting work. I, I don't know much more about it. I'm not really deeply familiar with um, optogenetics other than I know basically what it does. But this is interesting. And then they actually move the roboworm through a maze. So they're able to build this maze and move the roboworm using this information. So this is a great work. Um, then Okay, so now I want to get into maybe one more paper. And this is a paper on deep neural net tracking of human pluripotent stem cells reveals intrinsic behaviors directing morphogenesis. So this is a paper on deep learning, but applied not to embryos, but to pluripotent cells. So this is, uh, so they, they come up with this on the summary, lineage tracing is a powerful tool in developmental biology to interrogate the evolution of tissue formation. But the dense three-dimensional nature of tissue, and this is like in, in vivo, this is like your muscle tissue in C. elegans, for example, limits the ability, the assembly of individual cell trajectories into complete reconstructions of development. So when we have these, you know, the data that we're working with from C. elegans, that's cell tracking data. And they're basically, they put markers in the, in the uh, they make sure that the, um, the nuclei are visual, you know, visualized, and then they can track the cells using that that visual signal. So they they put some sort of fluorescent marker in the uh, nucleus, and they track the nucleus around uh, the embryo as it's moving, and they acquire the image in slices. So they're putting the slices together. They're using those uh, that provenance to sort of tell you know where in the embryo these things are, and then you have to normalize the data and it gives you this uh, this coordinate system. But what they're arguing is that maybe that's not the best, you know, that, that gives you incomplete information. It still doesn't give you a lot of information about cell trajectories. You need to infer a lot about it, and especially when you're dealing with thing, cells that differentiate over the course of development. So human-induced pluripotent stem cells, which are um, cells that they, what they call reprogram, um, can recapitulate aspects of developmental processes, providing an in vitro platform to assess the dynamic collective behaviors directing tissue morphogenesis. So now we have these kind of cells that we can take, you know, they might be like skin cells, they might, you know, and they can take, they can put a, a set of transcription factors in them and they can change the fate of them from say like muscle cells or skin cells into stem cells. And so you can actually observe this process in a culture. So you don't have to have it in a tissue. And you have the cells just in this, in this monolayer. And you can observe these processes 
of change. And so it can recapitulate aspects of developmental processes, providing an in vitro platform, and that means outside the body, that means in a dish, to assess the dynamic collective behaviors directing tissue morphogenesis. Here we trained an ensemble of neural networks to track individual HIPSCs in time-lapse microscopy, generating longitudinal measures of cell and cellular neighborhood properties on time scales from minutes to days. So now they're looking at this culture over minutes to days, they're tracking the cells within them. And this is a different world now from the organism because you have these cells and they have neighbors and they're moving around, there's some migration and they're differentiating. And so you can look at, this is not exactly like development, but it gives you some idea of what they're doing in, in this process of reprogramming. And I've actually done a lot of work on this, and I've actually done some modeling work on this. This is something that's, it's quite a de uh, departure from the embryo, but it's still, I think, informative. Our analysis reveals that while individual cell parameters are not strongly affected by pluripotency maintenance conditions, which is where the cells have, when they transform to these pluripotent cells, which means that they can, uh, you know, it's a state from which they can take another number of paths. So a pluripotent cell is something that is like a stem cell, so it doesn't really have a fate, a terminal fate, but it can become like a muscle cell or a brain cell, depending on where, you know, where it is in its pluripotency. So a totipotent cell is a cell that can reconstruct an organism. It can just become any cell type. And if a, a totipotent cell, and this is like maybe one of the four or eight cells and first four or eight cells in the embryo, if they divide, if they divide enough, they can differentiate and, and recreate an entire organism. A pluripotent cell, on the other hand, has an, a restricted set of fates, but they can still become a number of different things depending on where they are in their in the cell lineage. So, you know, oftentimes you'll have pluripotent cells that become like a number of different neural cell types, like neurons or muscle or glia. They won't necessarily become like say liver cells or germ cells, but they can make they can have they can take on a number of fates. And so um so, okay, so we were here, uh, regional changes in cell behavior predict cell fate in colony organizations. So now they're looking at regional changes, which I assume they mean spatial, cha spatial changes or what their neighbors are or whatever. By generating complete multicellular reconstructions of HIPSC behavior, our tracking pipeline enables fine grained understanding of morphogenesis by elucidating the role of regional behavior in early tissue formation. So this is, uh, so they, in the paper here, they talk about a uh, little bit about in vitro versus in vivo models. So they talk about the C. elegans data set here. This is the BAO 2006 data. Um, this is basically a, a very similar thing to the data, that, the data set that um, my NOC is working with. So automated tracking of cell migration within whole embryos in vivo has been limited both in size to small organisms such as C. elegans, so we know about the C. elegans case, due to, due to the difficulty of identifying and tracking cells in a crowded multicellular environment, and in scale due to the low throughput of 3D imaging and reconstruction techniques. So again, we work with small embryos because that's easy, but larger embryos are much harder. So they actually get into the idea of Turing patterns for morphogenesis, and we've talked about that, where you have a bunch of cells that get signals from the environment, and depending on what signals they're exposed to, they form different uh, types of, you know, they differentiate in different types, and then you get boundaries between signals, and that's where you get like stripes and other things where you have this different, you know, you have these gradients that uh, are different, you have this differentiating capacity, and this is how you get patterns in morphogenesis. So it's not, um, you know, it's something that we're, we always try to model, but it's it's hard to observe in, in the real biological systems. Um, these are physically interconnected cells, so we want to understand these kind of processes. Um, so similar multicellular organizational events have been observed in vitro, 
with human-induced pluripotent stem cells. So we've observed these kind of Turing patterns in pluripotent stem cells. So we've modeled, we, we've seen examples, I think, in the GSOC period of how these can be modeled using cellular automata. And you can actually see these in these pluripotent stem cell cultures, um, revealing their heterogeneous differentiation potential due to global positional cues, cell population boundaries, or cell-cell interactions. So you, what you basically have are these colonies that are like these little blobs surrounded by other types of cells that are not differentiated. And so you get these patterns. They don't just happen. Uh, the differentiation process doesn't happen randomly. They happen in these colonies, and the colonies form. Um, and so you can see and actually pick colonies of these uh, reprogrammed stem cells and transfer them to another place. That you know that the implication there is that they're just these. Uh, they they exhibit these kind of Turing patterns where they have you know, instead of being at random all over the place, they're in these colonies that are defined. Um, they're not stripes, but they're kind of like blobs, and you'll see them in a, it's very recognizable. In particular, because cell fate and function are strongly influenced by local interactions with the multicellular networks. Coordinated morphogenetic processes exhibit scale-free connectivity. Oh, that's interesting. They go into that area. Uh, cell behavior is coordinated through a central hub of influential cells, indicating that pop small populations of cells uh, established by highly connected organizing centers can invert, exert a large impact on the final composition of the developing tissue. So they actually get into networks here, which I didn't expect them to, but that's interesting in light of the work we have on um, embryo networks. So we'll put that aside for now. Uh, but recent advances in machine learning particularly deep neural networks, would have demonstrated superhuman performance and image segmentation. So they, uh, they go through that. Um, it looks like they're using, I guess, they talk about CNNs, UNETs. So what are they using here? Um, looks like they're using a UNET CNN because that's what they're reviewing. Uh, oh, no. In this study, we overcame the challenges of dense cell tracking by developing an ensemble of three neural networks. FCRNB, Countception, and a residual unit. So that's what they've used these in, in this ensemble of models. So now they're using this uh, ensemble of models to localize each individual cell nucleus in an HISPC colony. And as I said, they form these colonies, which are like these blobs that you'll see in the, in the culture layer. Uh, nuclei displacements were then connected between sequential frames of a time series enabling high spatiotemporal resolution of HIPSC behaviors over relevant developmental timescales of hours to days. This dense cell tracking pipeline revealed distinctive cell behaviors based on localization or location within the colony, cell heterogeneity in response to extracellular signaling molecules. So they were able to track this. They used human annotators uh, to sort of score the selected nuclei. So they actually used human annotators on the loop here. So I think they identified things through tracking and then they did some manual annotations of, of these cells. So that's interesting. I don't know, like, human annotation is both good and bad for a number of reasons, but it, they don't necessarily have labeled data here. So that's what they're gonna have to work with. And so it's, it's interesting to see how they're dealing with this problem. Um, so this is an example. So they have aggregate cells, um, they're unlabeled. They have some that are unlabeled and some that have the GFP label, right? So they have labels for the colonies and these are the colonies. So the colonies will have labels in them. Um, the cells that don't reprogram along the edges won't have labels. So you'll see, you'll be able to identify the cells in this colony, but then within the colony, we don't know there's no labels to the data. We don't know anything about these cells other than that they're either pluripotent or they're not. So you image these and you see these, you can see the fluorescence here. And so, uh, and then in this case, they show that you have human raters that are actually picking out, uh, because sometimes you get things like autofluorescence. So some cells that aren't pluripotent will have fluorescence. You have to use a threshold because sometimes, you know, the label will express, but it's incompletely 
uh, pluripotent. So there are a lot of things going on in these data that are hard to really understand, especially when you don't have labels. And so the, we have the human readers sort of creating labels for them and annotating them. So this is, again, like I said, both good and bad. Uh, but then they end up doing this ensemble segmentation where they segment these cells in the, in the nuclei by their location and they're able to, looks like they have pretty decent performance in their data. Um, so they call them heterotypic neural network ensembles. And so they're able to generate human quality segmentations. So they're actually segmenting them and then they're actually doing the human reader stuff. So they have the humans like kind of labeling that and they're using this ensemble model and they're matching the results. So they're matching the results of these models to a consensus. They're actually able to do this. Okay, so now let's see if they have anything else. Um, this is a good paper, I don't know. Okay, now they're doing spatiotemporal linkage of detections, and this enables long-term single cell tracking. So now they're doing this, uh, they're sort of building a model of, of, of migration and they're getting this, uh, they're doing a Delaunay triangulation, which is like a graph that they build. Um, this is sort of a spatial graph that they use to determine the spatial relationships between cell uh, nuclei. So this is the Delaunay triangulation. It's just like a network that's, um, it's, a, it's a graph uh, that they use to determine the sort of uh, it, it's like a series of triangles, basically, and it determines a spatial, uh, um, like sort of the coincidence of, of the cells, how close they are in space. So they're able to calculate cell neighborhoods from these Delaunay triangulations. Now they have the data segmented, and then uh, they're able to look at packing and migratory behaviors of undifferentiated pluripotent stem cells in these colonies. So now they're able to do, we compared standard pluripotency maintenance conditions using the CNN tracking algorithm. This is to look at heterogeneous behavior of the colonies. So here's the example here. You have colonies of two different sizes and they're able to analyze it. Um, and so then they're also able to look at lineage tracing of cell fate decisions during early morphogenetic induction and they show that here. Um, they look at the density of different, uh, uh, so the other thing you can do is look at different uh, uh, marker genes. So opt for EOMES and SOX2 are all marker genes. So they kind of tell you something about how pluripotent the cell is. If they're expressing high levels of opt for or SOX2, that's very pluripotent. If it's expressing very little opt for or SOX2, that's less pluripotent. And so using this technique, you can use different markers. You can use like a fluorescent marker for OCT4 or SOX2, and you can actually get an uh, assessment of the level of, of uh, expression of those genes because you use like a, you know, a control and you can actually get the full difference in expression. So you just, you know, use a, an index, then you can plot it out in a way that's, um, you know, you can use that data to plot out uh, not only the amount of expression, but their uh, movement, you know, their migration and their position in space. And so that's kind of what they're doing here. They're kind of like giving, you know, looking at a time course, they're looking at these different uh, properties of the cell, they're looking at how much they're expressing these marker genes, and then they're looking at how they move around the colony. So this is, this is very advanced um, stuff compared to when I was working on this. Um, yeah, so that's all we have for that paper. And I, I would definitely look at that if you're interested in how people are integrating um, these different markers and, and uh, machine learning and microscopy data. So, okay, so can you share the link to the deep end and pluripotency paper? Well, let me share the meeting folder and then I will also uh, put these up in the Slack. So that's the folder where the deep end and pluripotency paper is. And I'll put the individual paper in the Slack when I get the link to the uh, thing. Okay, thanks. 
Well, thank you for attending my knock, and Akshay was here. Thank you, Akshay, for attending. And if you're on YouTube, um, I'll be putting the links to the papers in the Slack and the recording. And um, thank you for attending, and um, have a good week. See everyone next week. Yeah, thank you. Great week ahead. Yeah, bye. Bye. bye.